Hello, I'm Karen Taylor, uh, Program Director for the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. And I'm so pleased that you could all be here this evening, particularly in such an inclement night. So thank you very much. I'm also particularly pleased because this marks the launch of our Labour, Literature and Landmark series. And for those of you who are new to our organisation, the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen was founded in 1785. This 228-year-old organisation continues to serve the city of New York through its educational, philanthropic and cultural programmes, including its tuition-free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library and a century-old lecture series. In fact, the General Society Lecture Series continues a tradition of public lectures that started the Society in 1837. By coincidence today, my colleague found a list of some of those lectures. These included 10 lectures in literature, as well as the importance of industrious habits for young men, and the character and writings of Lord Byron, who, by the way, in, 19, in 1837, had only been deceased for 13 years. Our lecture tonight is the first in a series of four landmark lectures during the series. Four New York architects will um, highlight the iconic buildings and landmarks of social, historical, and cultural significance. The series is created by Lin Lisa Easton, a partner in the New York City-based architecture and historic preservation firm, Easton Architects. And before introducing tonight's speaker, I'd like to acknowledge this program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, and also to thank Bauer and Dean for their generous support. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Frank J. Priel, AIA of Bayer, Blinder, Bale, Bell, Architects and Planners, who will discuss his company's award-winning work on the restoration of the lobby of the Empire State Building. The presentation will examine some of the many challenges that, the project ar that arose from the project. Um, by carefully researching and respecting the intent of the building's original architects, Bayer, Blinder Bell took the most famous building of the 20th century back a few steps in order to prepare it for the 21st century. And Frank will elaborate on this. Um, Mr. Priel, an associate partner at Bayer Blinder Bell, has over 20 years' experience in the design and management of significant historic preservation projects. He has led many of these the company's most complex restoration and revitalization projects, and its projects have been recognized with many prestigious preservation awards. Other projects he has played a significant role in include the Grand Central and Morgan Library and Museum. Mr. Priel is also a regular presenter and visiting critic in architecture, preservation, and urban design at Pratt Institute and at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. I'm so pleased to introduce to you Frank Priel. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We just say BBB for short. It's easier that way for everyone, all involved. Let me see if I can do this so that I can reach the equipment at the same time. Move that back a bit. Okay. Is that good? Because I need to be able to change. There we are. Great, thank you. I am Frank Pryle, and I'm very privileged to be here this evening uh, in this historic landmark space to be able to talk about another significant historic landmark that I also had the privilege of being involved in for some time. And what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the building itself, give you a sense of the history of the building. Everyone understands its iconic value and the reason it's so significant, or they think they do anyway, but I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the reasons for it. And I'd like to talk then about the condition that we found it in, why Bayer Blinder Bell, or BBB for short, was brought in to do what we do, to be able to restore, revitalize, and redefine the lobby of the building specifically, but then also contribute to a very large scale upgrade that the building underwent and is continuing doing to undergo under its enlightened uh, ownership by the Malkin organization. Let 
Oops. We'll get the hang of this here. There we are. The building itself, I like to say, was the product of the best of times and the worst of times. And that sounds cliche, but it's in fact true because the spirit that drove the design, the optimism, the great sense of energy that came from the 1920s and the great economic boom that generated such growth and tremendous strength was the, the vision that went into creating a building that would be the tallest in the world. So by 1929, uh, investors, including Pierre Dupont, uh, and had brought in Al Smith, who was the former uh, governor of the state of New York, and another group of investors to be able to envision what would be a tremendous landmark that would capture and uh, somehow represent the spirit of that time. So that they did, and they had a design ready to go. They went through a series of iterations over a period of several years, but by 1929, they were ready to build. And what happened in 1929, of course, was the collapse of the economy, the completed collapse, but they already had the design in place. So what they were able to do was to take advantage of an extraordinary pool of labor that was readily available and relatively inexpensive, willing to work 24-7. Now, coupled with a brilliant and very forward-thinking approach to the efficiency of construction that the Starrett Corporation uh, was able to, uh, uh, to organize, they were able to erect this building in 14 months. It's almost unheard of. I mean, that concludes the demolition of the former Waldorf Astoria Hotel that was on that site. Uh, and then the laying of the foundations and 102 stories plus the mooring mast above in 14 months. And here are some iconic sort of images of that construction, also showing uh, in the lower right-hand corner, the every two months, a sort of step-by-step -step process of that construction. Uh, the image itself, of course, the silhouette of the building is known around the world, and that was the result of uh, zoning regulations at the time that accounted for setbacks, the sort of the wedding cake shape of it. Uh, it was also uh, uh, studied very carefully for shade and shadowing in the new Art Deco style. I'll talk a little bit about how that represented itself in the interior of the building. There were also discussions, of course, in the popular imagination. Uh, Al Smith was uh, a well-known uh, salesperson as well. He was able to uh, encourage and continue and cheer as a cheerleader for the development of the building. Uh, one of the last ideas that they had was they might be able to possibility of uh, docking dirigibles to the mooring mast on the very top never actually happened in practicality. But again, it was one of these other kinds of ideas that captured the imagination and spirit of the people as the building was being built. What we do know about the research that we did on the Empire State Building is that it's always been a place where exciting things happened, where events took place. And this also contributed to the imagination. I mean, no one really has visited New York City. No tourist still to this day can walk away from this city without having, and having said that they really came and visited if they haven't been to the Empire State Building. And that's still very, very true. And here we have just a sort of series of images that we found during our archival research. The lower left-hand corner is just as a wedding celebration, an anniversary going on. And then we have two distinguished guests. Lower right, we have uh, the queen and uh, crown prince. I was corrected. He was not the king, but he's the prince, I believe. And then, of course, Fidel Castro back when our relations with, with Cuba were still in uh, good condition. And the building itself was the product of a particular moment in time. Again, the design was almost like a perfect storm, if you will, of, uh, of collaborative efforts. Um, the height, the result of technology which allowed elevators to go to unprecedented heights. Uh, the step back shape of it was the result of this new approach to the skyscraper design in the Art Deco style. We'll talk a little bit about that more as we go on the inside. But what we learned from our research as well was that for all of the photographs that are taken of this extraordinary building, most of them focus on the outside, this silhouette that's known around the world. Very, very few resulted uh, show from the interior of the building, um, which uh, led us to understand that people really didn't appreciate the landmark interior the land, uh, the, uh, of the lobby itself. The architects, Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon, are not really, really well known, and they're a firm that remains to be researched. There's still a tremendous amount of work that could be done for, one, for, for this particular firm, but they were all from a particular um, uh, discipline. They were all trained uh, not directly at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, where many of the first generation architects in the United the neoclassicists studied, and which resulted in a building like Grand Central, for example. They were the next generation. What they did was they took the principles of Beaux-Arts classicism and simplified them. They were responding to a slightly different time. I mentioned a moment ago that the 20s were known for great economic strength and speed and productivity. 
Well, the architecture responded to that by simplifying. You still have the same principles of, class of, of, of classical architecture in proportion, scale, attention to detail. You still see in a lobby, for example, the way that the column, the, the arrangement of the wall is set up with a base area here, and then a middle, and then a cornice line above. All of that is typical to the Beaux-Arts architecture. It's very symmetrical. The proportions are very grand, but they're done, they're rendered in a much simpler way, something much more efficient, more cost-effective, more responsive to the spirit of the machine. Um, and rather than having rich ornamental detail that you might get in an, an elaborate cornice, for example, that you might see in Grand Central Terminal, for example, here you just have a simple kind of, uh, of, of dental patterning. Um, so that you have a more two-dimensional uh, rendering of that. And then on the walls, and we'll talk a little bit about more, this more in detail as we, as we go through, rather than uh, having rich profile, much more attention is, is given to the way the stone is displayed, the way the stone is cut, the way the stone is arranged on the wall. So it's much more about surface detail and scale than it is about rich ornament. The lobby itself, over time, was not uh, significantly changed. It was preserved through what we like to call the process of default. It's kind of like we call it preservation by uh, benign neglect. I don't need to go into the, the, the Byzantine and somewhat an intriguing history of the ownership of the Empire State Building. That's an entirely different and rather fascinating story. But suffice it to say that by the time we arrived in 19, uh, in, I'm sorry, in 2005, the building had been modified only to the extent that it needed to be in order to sustain the generation of rent revenues. There was really the, the went through various regimes, the Helmsley ownership into the Malkin control, but over that time, wasn't that any significant damage was done to the lobbies necessarily, but that it was modified to suit immediate needs. For example, the ceiling was covered over. We'll see images of that in a moment. Uh, and moder ductwork was installed in certain locations. So there was very uh, limited amount of actual damage that was done to the building, but enough was done so that something needed to be changed. Ownership took over in, uh, and was consolidated in 2006 with the Malkin organization, and it was Tony Malkin, who was the son of uh, Peter Malkin, who was the grandson of Lawrence Ween, partner of Harry Helmsley. So kept it in the family all the way through, but it's Tony Malkin's vision to be able to bring this landmark back to the way that it had been when the original architects designed it. And that was a perfect opportunity for us to come in. When we began our work, what we found was a lobby that had been modified in an ad hoc manner, just kind of in response to immediate needs. He saw, thought that there was an opportunity for the building to be returned to its original status, to take advantage of the good bones that existed, and for to us to understand and to revision the original intent of those architects, as Karen mentioned a moment ago. A way for Bayer Blinder Bell to put ourselves into the shoes of Shreve Lamb and Harmon, if you will, in a rather modest way. I mean, there is a sort of a, sort of a, a bold idea to be able to understand what the original architects might have wanted, but this is the way that we approach our work, and we do that through a great deal of research. So what we discovered when we arrived was a lobby that had been modified, as I've said slightly, you'll see that there are uh, a series of, of uh, turnstiles that had been installed just immediately post-2011, discuss that in a moment or two, uh, some artwork that had been installed here known uh, affectionately as the Eight Wonders of the World. Well, th at first, this was not the reason that we were brought in to work. What we did at first began on a very kind of limited scale. What the Malkin organization needed to know was how the lobby worked. So we really began more as master planners. We came in in order to do an analysis of the way the lobby worked so that this would inform any kind of uh, proposed changes that we might make going forward. What we did was an analysis of the way the lobby behaved, who the constituent groups are that use it, where do they come from, where do they want to go, how do they get there. Uh, we are, were able to simplify all of that into an, an under, into identification of three component groups. One are the tenants who rent office space above. 
The building had been known for many, many years after it was finished as the empty state building because of the difficulty in renting spaces and bringing people into it because of its uh, completion during the height of the Depression. So what this resulted in was a great deal of solo, sort of small offices, lawyers, doctors, uh, garment showrooms, all of which have a tremendous amount of foot traffic. So that's the second constituent group, are the guests who come to visit these offices on the upper floors, contributing to a tremendous amount of traffic coming in. The third group are the tourists. Over four million people come every year to visit the observation deck upstairs, a significant business in and of itself. So we had to somehow be able to create uh, a discreet and intelligent way for these people to move through this lobby without conflicting with one another to make it much more efficient and to make the experience of those people coming in uh, much better, more pleasant. So what we began to do was to map the lobby to identify the most important pieces here, the Fifth Avenue lobby we saw a moment ago here, this being Fifth Avenue here, 34th Street above to the north, 33rd below. This is the primary entrance off of Fifth Avenue, and then we have the secondary entrances off of the side streets, and then two symmetrical corridors on either side, 34th Street and 33rd Street, and what we began to do was to give them each their own identity. The Fifth Avenue lobby became the area for the tourists, where they would come and be able to appreciate the great uh, mural on the rear wall and to go upstairs to begin their long journey of queuing and ticketing uh, up to the 86th observation deck. The 34th Street lobby became the primary tenant lobby, giving it uh, more significance, the introduction of a new uh, visitor center desk I'll show you in just a moment. Then the 33rd Street lobby was identified more for support. This was where shoeshine, where FedEx, where other kinds of, uh, where food service might be. So you see that we begin to identify and assign values and identities to these spaces and it helps us to clarify and understand the way they work. The first step, once we were able to clarify and understand better, is to organize the way that visitors came into the building, and that meant redefining the whole security process. I mentioned a moment ago that immediately after 9-11, let me see if this is, there is my image here, uh, we had a tremendous amount of turnstiles. The entire interior lobby had been cordoned off so that once you went through the turnstiles, then you were in an interior elevator court. What we wanted to do was to redefine that so that people would come to the building, would go to a visitor center desk, would identify their destination, and then be given a pass to go and directed to go where they needed to go. Tenants who know where they're going on a daily basis will be able to navigate on their own and not need to be checked in. We looked at precedents within the building. There is a desk in the Fifth Avenue area. Uh, and what we did was began to design a new piece of, we call furniture, it's a new addition, but it's intended to suit all of the needs of current technology, uh, create a concierge location where uh, people can be greeted and can be uh, uh, sent on their way, and still look like it had always intended to be there within the lobby. Some of the drawings that we put together. Whenever we go to, I'll talk a little bit more detail about the process of landmark review, what we did here, because there were so many component parts within the lobby presentation, we created a large master plan which had a whole series of different pieces. Landmarks approved all of them on a piece-by-piece -piece basis, and then the owners were able to select and choose which ones, which pieces of the uh, approval process they wanted to, to, to uh, construct. We created some artwork that went into a former uh, storefront directly behind the lobby uh, desk. This was a commissioned work of art from uh, Denise Ames, who is a, a glass artist that we had worked with at Rockefeller Center. This is a mock-up that she did of that final artwork uh, using LED illumination behind and several layers of, of cut and etched glass in front. This is the finished artwork. What we asked her to do really was just to pick up on some motifs uh, within the lobby itself and some decorative ornamental elements and she was able to use those and elaborate on them. The desk itself was intended, as I said, to look like it had always been there. Very important part of that was the stonework that we were able to, uh, to attach as a veneer to the outside. Um, I'll speak in a little bit moment about the selection of the, of, the, of the marble itself, but 
at this point, it was intended that it looked very much like a garland, like a, a, a book match patterning that was used elsewhere in the lobby, and we'll see that in a moment. The security turnstiles were a kind of a, an overreaction. Every building owner in New York City had to react somehow to, uh, in, in a very immediate way, to the adverse effect of 9-11. Uh, the Empire State Building, of course, being of such significance and prominence, the best that they could do was to understand and try to block people from going in who, and, and go through a very elaborate process of screening, uh, very much like a, you would go through at an airport. However, 10 years later, uh, through risk analysis, owners of buildings began to understand that was not necessarily the most efficient way in order to prevent these kinds of events. What they really needed to do was to do pre-screening. They needed for people to, uh, to apply in advance, online perhaps, call in advance and understand exactly where they wanted to go, and then be handled by a, a person. It's always best for a concierge or some kind of a, an assistant to be able to, or a guard to be able to help someone guide their way through. So the turnstiles, although they were necessary, we were able to relocate them in a way that was more appropriate to the architecture and which made the screening process much more pleasant. What we did was we were able to, instead of having one large area that was sort of an inside versus an outside, we relocated each individual bar uh, group of turnstiles to a place where they would not necessarily be seen, where they would set back from the sight lines within the lobby itself and would create smaller separate banks so that once one was checked in at the desk, they would be sent to the specific lobby areas and be able to get in on their own. Um, we also had to accommodate uh, handicap accessibility, a very important part of the code compliance for moving through the building, and so we have gates that will allow people to do that as well. And here's the finished product. You see how rather than being out and proud within the corridor itself, we recess them a bit so that they're not seen as you stand, but yet the technology of the subway barrier style, which was part of an earlier approval that the Landmarks Commission had uh, uh, confirmed, they requested that that same style be reused again. They thought it was appropriate to the particular time of the building, the 1930s uh, era of the Empire State Building. And then we tried to customize it with a little bit of marble. In this case, it's a, a, a red um, a pattern that matches the, the red marble on the floor. The directories are a little bit of architectural history as well in and of themselves. Whenever anyone walked in through the four major public entries, the first image that you were confronted with was the extraordinarily large building directory. Of course, everyone remembers when you went in and were looking for where to go or your destination, you would go up to one of these signs and very carefully find the name of the place you were going and the floor and then go on your way. Well, in the Empire State Building, of course, they had at the time that we arrived, 885 individual tenants. They had a single individual whose responsibility it was to go around to these four directories every day and update them with tenants who had left or tenants who had died or tenants who had moved out. So we had what was left over, this kind of obsolete technology. And once we installed a new visitor center desk where people would come in and actually be checked in uh, electronically, these uh, directories were no longer necessary. Ownership also wanted to have them removed because there's, it, it, there's, there's concerns of um, security where uh, you would rather have tenants be anonymous rather than people coming in and reading down the long lists of names. Uh, we thought that they had a rather pleasant kind of nostalgic effect, that there was an interesting image associated with them. It would be wonderful to have them. Ownership didn't agree with us, unfortunately. So what we had to do, because they are part of the integral historic fabric of the lobby, we had to preserve them, but to repurpose them. We had to come up with an idea about how they could be reused. We had all kinds of interesting creative ideas. Um, Landmarks, interestingly enough, does not have jurisdiction over the content of signs or imagery. They do over the enclosure or the sign, the lettering, the graphics of the sign itself. So 
they were really more interested in what we were not going to do than what we were going to do. And what we assured them was that there would not be any kind of moving imagery, there would be no sort of a sound or, or light, wouldn't turn it into kind of a sports bar effect of different television screens. Uh, there would also be no significant advertising. They wouldn't be leased out to local businesses, for example. But what the owners, what we, what we proposed would be a series of, re, of, of changing art scenes or photography that would reflect on the building and speak to the significance of the building. Ownership has done that, but they've kind of merged it with images and information about significant new tenants within the building. The ceiling restoration is probably the most obvious an immediate uh, element of, of the restoration process. Um, when we first became involved in this master planning process, a moment I mentioned ago, um, some of the facilities people came to us and said, you know, we are aware that when our painters were doing some restoration work, that there's an old mural on the ceiling above the dropped uh, lay-in tiles, and we'd like you to take a look at it. So we did. They took down ceiling tiles, and we were able to find remnants of the original uh, ceiling mural that had been originally done by the Rambush organization, and I know that there's a significant representative here this evening. Um, but you see what had happened was over time it had become extremely damaged, and it had simply been painted over with lead-based paint, strip fluorescent fixtures had been installed, and then a lay-in acrylic tile ceiling was dropped, obscuring it. We can understand that, you know, an artwork when it was installed in 1931 would become old and damaged over time and it would be very expensive and difficult to restore. And of course, the building never really had the wherewithal and, 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 and the tools did not exist to restore such a significant work of art. So it was really just covered over. But what, what we did was uh, we investigated the feasibility of the restoration of that work. We worked with Evergreen uh, Studios. They, you saw an image a moment ago of a conservator taking samples so that we understood exactly what the composition of that work of art was. And then we did a study that analyzed two different approaches. One is the restoration of the work itself, and then two would be the recreation of an entirely new one. What we, and then we took that to landmarks for, their, for discussion. The conclusion was that in order to restore the original, you really would sort of go over the line. It would be more of a restoration because you'd have to remove all of the lead-based paint and then you would really be recreating anyway. So what they agreed to allow us to do was to recreate the mural completely, an entirely new recreation using the exact same materials uh, being done in the Evergreen Studios, only a matter of eight or 10 blocks away on 30th uh, Street and, and 10th Avenue, and to install it on a new ceiling that was located six inches below the original. You see here a mock-up that we did that shows the new ceiling directly below the original. And these are light fixtures that had not yet been removed. And what that did was to allow us to preserve the original artifact in place. The conceit being that should there ever be a time when restoration processes should advance and we'd be able to restore that original work, it's still in situ, it's still in place. But in the meantime, we did everything we could uh, to restore, to recreate an entirely new mural in exactly the same way that the original had been done. Here are artisans working within our Evergreen Studios, uh, cutting, frisking, and um, installing the, uh, the new materials, which are, it's, it's a uh, combination of paints, glazes, aluminum, and gold leaf. Here you see the gold leaf being installed by hand. All of this work, over 15,000 square feet, was done by hand. And our obligation as a part of the process was to allow all uh, the daily business of the building to be able to go on uninterrupted. So we created a scaffolding in the public areas and work could go on above. Uh, any work that went on actually in the lobby itself that might conflict with um, uh, activities had to be done during the hours of either midnight through seven in the morning. Here are some really remarkable images of these artisans putting up this work. As I say, 15,000 square feet, but largely done by hand for the most part. These are all members of the Wallpapers Union. Once the work was done, once the studio work was completed, it was rolled up for a period of months or so while final preparations were made on the ceiling, but then it really just went up in a matter of days, very, very quickly. 
the adhesive is a clay-based organic uh, adhesive, uh, which has uh, no solvents in it, um, but will last uh, over 100 years. This is what we call the dance floor. This is over the 34th Street corridor. Uh, and here, the much grander, this is the triple height lobby uh, on Fifth Avenue. And all public, act public activity is going on below. The lighting and decorative glass was another element similar to the mural, which required a great deal of research and kind of a creative approach. You'll see here above the elevators, there are original decorative cast glass uh, linear panels in an integral light fixture between the ceiling, this kind of ziggurat sort of uh, shaped uh, aluminum leaf ceiling, and the marble walls. All of that glass at some point, probably the same time that the new ceiling was installed, was removed and discarded, and we had no samples of it whatsoever other than these photographs that we were of the original the lobby when it was completed around 1931. So what we did was a little detective work. Um, Bayer Blinder Bell prides itself on its architectural uh, research. We call it our homework. We don't really do any proposals for new work until we've exhaustively uh, looked up as much as we possibly can about the history of the building and the original architects. One resource that we tapped in particular here was the Corning Museum of Glass, where a significant amount of uh, architectural glass was made for over 100 years. Uh, they no longer produce glass, but they do have a remarkable archive and a tremendous and a, a terrific archival um, historical staff of librarians. And what they were able to do was to pull out specification information from trade journals in the 19, early 1930s that described these glass panels perfectly. 12 by 12 units, uh, sculpture design, they have weight and thickness. And what we were able to do was to then have a kind of a mini competition amongst glass uh, fabricators and artisans. And we went across the country and had about six serious submissions and ended up with a remarkable artisan, a woman who was half artist, half uh, 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 technician. She had a, uh, an interesting and very cost-effective method of having hot glass that was slumped and then dropped into a mold and we were able to produce this uh, new linear light fixture in, uh, glass installation, um, over 7,500 um, lineal feet. The fixtures themselves, as I say, are integral to the building, so they are a part of the landmark fabric. Originally, they had individual incandescent bulbs, so you would have seen little hot spots behind all of this glass. What we did was replace that, reconfigured the, the, the enclosure itself, and installed a linear fluorescent tube system, which is code compliant and has a certain amount of light that's obligated to, for, for code compliance for safety. But we're also able to dim it so that we can have it as bright as we need for if work is being done in the lobby, but then to bring it down to approximately two foot candles. And this was, again, another directive of Tony Malkin. Whenever there was a question about what we should do, a design decision, he'd always say, go back and figure out what it was when it was finished. What was it in 1931? We were able to find specification information that even that defined the foot candle level within the lobby to approximately between two and five foot candles. That's not a lot of light. So the entire uh, effect of walking into the space from the street would be very different than what was there now and even different from what contemporary uh, 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 customers would expect. But we were able to bring it down to that level so that you have light which more efficiently bounces off the ceiling and fills the space below. It's a much more dra dramatic and theatrical effect and that's key because, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, Rambush Studios, uh, who were the decorative uh, artisans who did the ceiling, were also well known for the theaters that they did at that time, and the Art Deco was very much a theatrical kind of experience. The light fixtures had an interesting story as well. You'll, you'll notice, in addition to the integral fixtures that are within the lobby, there were also chandeliers. These bridges are actually part of second story corridors. They still exist. Uh, originally, they were a means of getting from the elevator bank to uh, banks that were located on the second story. There were safes and there were safe deposit boxes, uh, so they had a great deal of customers. The banks are long gone, and for the most part, these 
corridors, the second story corridors, are used as a part of the travel uh, route for customers who are tourists who have bought tickets to go up to the observation deck above. We noticed, though, in this historic photograph that the chandelier seemed out of time. It didn't seem deco to us. It seemed anachronistic, to use a, a fancy word. But the thinking was that perhaps at the last minute, they were in a hurry to finish. They needed something to complete the design, and they got something that was more convenient. This hunch became, this, this was actually just to show you how the condition of the uh, bridge itself is today. We have to have glass in it because it is a corridor, and there are fire and noise considerations. Um, smoke considerations between inside and outside. You'll also see that the ceiling above had been, the beautiful historic ceiling had been filled in. But during our research, we found original blueprints from the office of Shreve Lamb and Harmon. And if you look very carefully, you'll see there's just an idea here of what a chandelier might have been. We thought that this was enough for us to work on. It was a clue. It was a way for us to seize what something that Sharif Lamb and Harman might have intended, but perhaps did not have the, the time or maybe there was not the money to fulfill. We thought how wonderful it would be to use this as a place to, of, to start, as an idea, and then to carry that through. Landmarks agreed, and fortunately so did ownership. So we took this idea and worked with Rambush Studios now into its fourth, if I'm not mistaken, fourth or fifth generation. They focus on historic lighting now. These drawings are done by hand. This really is the old-fashioned way. Through a series of iterations, back and forth, a little bit of push and pull, a little bit of concession to modern technology, some minor modifications, some adjustment for scale, some acknowledgement of modern materials, we came up with what we thought was a very accurate and honest representation of that image, that little sketch that I showed you a moment ago. One kind of eureka moment that uh, we had was the idea that we would not attach it to the ceiling, that we would drop it down like a true chandelier so that the light would be able to shine up on the uh, mural ceiling above. But all of this study here, again, all done in pencil um, by hand, uh, studies the different relationships of glass to uh, nickel-plated steel to bronze, all in proportions, all in ways the connections are made so that we would understand the geometry of this fixture, this very complicated geometry. Here we are in Rambush Studios in their, where, in their um, um, uh, 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 warehouse, in their actual where the shop where the fixtures are made. Um, and this is a mock-up that was done to understand the connections and how the light fixtures would work and the relationship of the fixtures within the uh, chandelier uh, and brightness through the glass. And here's the finished product. You see that we have a kind of a smaller version because we have to work within the confines of the enclosed corridor today. So we have this, what we call this upside down jacuzzi, but it is a representative version of the earlier ceiling and then the location of the new chandelier right in the center. And it is a really remarkable uh, kind of recreation, we think, uh, a fulfillment of this idea, the original, of the intent of the original architects. And I like to think that with over four million people walking underneath it every year, it's probably one of the, there are two, we created two on either side, the best appreciated chandeliers probably in the city. The medallion lighting also was an interesting feature. Uh, the spirit of the building, of course, was a celebration of all of the trade unions that contributed to its completion. So when the building was finished, the owners put up these medallions that celebrated each of the unions that contributed to that process. Here, for example, machines, uh, you know, the elevator lifts, the concrete pours, each one of the, the decorative artists uh, uh, all had their own medallion within the building. And what we did was to illuminate them so that they could be seen. I said we had brought the level of light down down within the, the lobby itself to a, a low theatrical level, but we did use very modern uh, technology uh, from, derived from theater design to be able to illuminate them so that you can st they stand out. And here we had to hide them in the discrete locations so that they would throw the light particularly onto each of those medallions. The marble restoration in and of itself would have been a heroic effort, even if we had done no other work. Uh, we were told when we came to the project that efforts had been made to locate the original stone, but had been unsuccessful. We were told we would never find it. 
This is a challenge, of course, in all restoration work. Architects all the time have to find correct stone in order to match existing. And I don't, that, although I have esteemed members of the stone industry here and people who, who supplied us, I don't think I would be insulting them if I said that it's a very complicated process and finding stone sometimes is difficult. Provenance of stone is unclear. Where does it come from? How do we find it? How can we get it? We were told we would have a very difficult time matching the original marble. We had a combination of extraordinary luck. We had some terrific support from people within the profession, and we also had a great deal of effort that we had, and we had the support of the owners in order to find what we needed. What had happened in the mid-60s was that original marble um, niches, decorative panels on the wall, had been removed and replaced. This was about 1964, 65, around the time of the, uh, uh, the second um, uh, World's Fair in, uh, in Flushing Meadows, um, and had been replaced with illuminated backlit acrylic panels, somewhat kitschy art. They were called the Eight Wonders of the World. The seven were, of course, the seven uh, well-known uh, uh, wonders of the world, and then the eighth was the Empire State Building. They were extremely popular with tourists. They were uh, photographed on a regular basis by people who came through. But what they did do was also to throw an entirely inappropriate blue light into the lobby, completely changing the character of this rich and very warm uh, original marble. So the challenge for us was first to identify locations that could be replaced, and then secondly to identify uh, sources for the marble itself. We had a very difficult time even identifying it. We went back to original specifications and they had a very different description of the marble that had been installed. And the reason for that was at the very last minute, to the best of our understanding, the stone that the architects had originally specified was unavailable at the t at the, at the, under the, the need that they have in the extraordinary uh, accelerated schedule of installation. So they had to make a complete change at the last minute. And what they ended up with was what we call a breccia sestina. It's a very warm, uh, red, uh, and highly ornamental uh, marble, but very, very difficult to find. So what we did was we began our search, and through a stroke of luck, we were referred to, from uh, someone within my office to uh, ABC out in Greenpoint, and we walked out with a little sample of the stone that we had and spoke to Agnes Basalka, who became not only a, a representative, but also a friend and a, a mentor, supporter through this whole process. And she said, yes, well, I think I might have a few slabs of that stone. And we didn't believe her. We thought she was just going to show us something that she wanted to sell us. In fact, we went and found 32 slabs of exactly the right kind of marble. I mean, it was a perfect match. We couldn't believe it. We thought we were geniuses. We thought that we had solved, you know, this was, we were, we were had, had resolved all of our problems. It was perfect. It was the right kind of stone, but it simply was not enough. We had to find other stones as well. This is a Rosa Formosa this is, uh, that we had to go to Italy to find. This is an additional block of the same marble that we did also find in Italy, but it was not exactly the same. It was very, very close. It didn't have the same kind of veining characteristics, but it was almost an identical match, so it was very fortunate. So at the end of the search, we had 32 slabs that we had found in Brooklyn, very easily and very quickly, and then a block that we were able to cut up and use for our purposes that we bought in uh, Forte de Marmi, which is near Pisa in Italy. And then we began this rather elaborate process of design. What we did was understood through the historic photographs and through other examples that still existed in the building, the way that the marble had been arranged. And I mentioned a moment ago that it was one of the characteristics of the deco to arrange very carefully the, uh, the, the cut slabs of stone in a book match pattern. And in this case, they had what, they call, what we call a, a, a double book match over two axes, not only uh, reflecting symmetrically along this axis, but then also above as well, creating uh, a rather unique patterning. So what we did was I individually, I went through the hundred and some odd slabs that we had. I photographed each one individually. And then I worked with an artist in my office to identify areas of the best characteristics. And we used the computer to create photo generated, computer generated images to arrange the patterns and present those to the owner of the building. And we did this in hundreds of different uh, examples. And he picked uh, with us uh, eight that he thought were most appropriate. 
once we had those eight images, then we had to create what we call these little roadmaps here so that we could deliver this package to the stone fabricators. And they would know exactly how to mark out these three by four foot panels, uh, pieces of the larger slabs to cut exactly where they needed to be cut and then to assemble them, how you would have particular match points and be arranged around this, in this particular niche. We had no stone to lose. We could not lose one panel because we had nothing, we had no extra. So in order to assure that this was done appropriately, I personally spent hundreds of hours in Long Island City at the marble shop myself, blocking out with blue tape, uh, confirming before any of these slabs went up onto the table saws to be cut. Here is another image that we created uh, also on the computer. This is a, um, showing each and every one of the patterns that was then approved by the owner, and then we arranged them so that he could see what the final product would look like. And the installation was done by the top stone installers in New York City. Here is an example of a photograph I took early on of one of the slabs that was loaned to us by ABC before we had even bought it and put it in. You, know, you can almost you can not even see the separation, the difference between the uh, original uh, wall material behind and the new slab in front. This is actually a piece of, if not this slab, then one very, very similar that we had cut and installed. Part of what we do as restoration architects is, to, as I say, to accept the humility involved in recognizing that the work that we do may not even be acknowledged. I mean, it's, for us, it's a great compliment when someone comes to us after the work is done and says, well, you know, exactly what did you do? Part of that is understanding that what we did was recreated something that you would walk past, that you would not be upset by, that you knew was originally intended, that had been there, intended to be there all along. These are images of the final restoration. We not only did work on the inside, but we also did some work on the outside, and I'd like to describe that briefly as well. The lobby carries through. Part of the revitalization of the building is dependent on the rent revenues generated by the retail stores on the ground floor. We were able to find a lot of images of the exterior storefronts of the building. Um, these are pictures that were displayed when the building was completed because they had no retail tenants. They were not able to fill those stores at all, so they had a display that celebrated the construction of the building for almost a year and a half before they put any. Here you can see this is opening day. These are just pictures because there really were no retail tenants to be had. But we did have images of the original storefronts. You can see that there are armatures, if you look very carefully, for uh, integral uh, awnings that have been lost over time. And then there are these ornamental mullions and capital crowns here that are all part of the Art Deco vocabulary. And then stonework that would have taken signage. Here are just some detailed photographs as well. And what we did was we began to prepare a master plan for new storefronts. The storefronts had been modified significantly over time. If I think I can just jump to the photograph, I'd rather do that if I can find that here. I'll go right there. I'm sorry. Here is, here's what I was looking for. This is what the storefronts had become through the 60s and 70s. This is an early study that was done uh, when the building was landmarked in the early 1980s. But you would barely recognize this except for little elements here of the Empire State Building because there's no control over how a tenant can treat their own individual space. There's no uniformity, no consistency, no uh, uh, requirements that are placed into the lease of the actual tenants themselves. So what I'll do is I'll jump back just for a moment and show you the work that we did. We created what we call a master plan, which is approved by the Landmarks Commission. We do a series of analyses of all of the different types of storefronts that it would be necessary for a retail tenant, acknowledging uh, their needs for access, for handicap accessibility, and also for this unique uh, characteristic that's within the Empire State Building called the stack effect. The stack effect is the result of the building acting like a large chimney. Before there were mechanical systems or any kind of mechanical fire purge, in these large skyscrapers there were large open shafts in the middle of the building, so when it's very cold outside and warm inside, the building acts like a large chimney and sucks people in from the outside. So we, it makes it very difficult and dangerous sometimes to operate swing doors. So what we did was we installed where there had never been 
revolving doors before. We gave retailers the opportunity to have revolving doors, and then also a swing door that would match the original decoration and ornamentation that was designed by Shreve Lam and Harmon. And what we did was we created a prototype that you could be used by any tenant at any time. Unlike what we did at Grand Central, where we were able to start with a clean slate and empty out all of the tenants and do all of the storefronts at once, there were lease obligations in place at the Empire State Building. So as tenants change out, the master plan of this kit of parts of an approved design uh, is written into the lease of the tenants and they're obligated to comply with this approved design. It's pre-approved by landmarks so that if they show something that looks extremely similar, they'll just get a rubber stamp and they can go ahead. If they choose to vary or need for whatever reason to vary from this design, then they would have to go through the much more elaborate and costly process of review and approval. We also worked on interior storefronts. Again, going through an elaborate process of analysis, identifying all of the different ornamental patterns and creating a similar master plan for the inside as well. Signage is always very much of an issue with, with tenants. They want as much as they possibly can have. Um, so it's our obligation to control it and to figure out a way to do it that is noticeable but still is appropriate to the architecture of the building. Uh, so we limit it in certain ways. We try to illuminate it to make it more visible. We even introduced a new element that had never existed in the Empire State Building before. And this is a blade sign, an illuminated blade sign. We'd had success with these at the concourse level of Rockefeller Center and uh, ownership and tenants found them very attractive as well. So those were approved by landmarks also. Uh, in addition to the retail signage, there's also other kinds of signage within the building. We call it regulatory or wayfinding signage. It's a very different kind of signage. Uh, it's what people use to make their way through the building, to navigate through the building where they're going in, but then also if they have to get out in a hurry as well. So there's com compliance, code compliance signage as well. Um, it just adds another level of information where we always say where there's too much information, it's very difficult to understand. So part of our obligation is to control it and to make it legible, but to put it in places where it needs to be, where, where it should be appropriate. Um, one of the steps that we took to kind of unify it was to work with a graphic designer to create an entirely new font that was unique to the Empire State Building. We did that by studying all of the existing lettering and signage throughout the building and then coming up, actually hiring a, and here's sort of inappropriate signage that had happened over time, neon and a bad sort of 1960s interpretation of a deco understanding of original of the 1930s style. But we came up with an entirely new, this is a brand new font that was created by a graphic designer and the Empire State Building bought it so that they own this now, the rights to it. They use it for all their retail signage on the exterior of the building, all their identification and all their um, uh, correspondence, business correspondence and letterhead. What the tenants now are obligated, we also worked with, we, we, we created and, and, and sort of invented a new light fixture type that is uh, a, a strip fixture, sort of a sandwich that uses this new font, but then has an LED side lit illumination. So it glows and we set it out a couple of inches away from the granite slab behind so that it has this really remarkable kind of illuminated effect at night. And here you see three examples. These are actual signs in place in uh, new storefronts. On the interior, we allow them to use their branded font. A lot of tenants actually have spent a lot of money for a recognizable name or logo. They're allowed to use that on the inside, but not on the outside of the building. And all of this, again, is heavily regulated. All of these documents that you see here are part of our signage guidelines, and these are written to the lease of this other tenant so that there is a control over where and how and what they can show on their storefronts. And it's all done in a very uh, equal way so that all the tenants feel like they are being equally controlled. They don't, uh, are not concerned that someone else has more signage than they do. And this is part of that wayfinding. If you've never really thought about it, if you go through a building and just stop to think about how much information is given to you and where you get it from and what you need to know and what you don't need to know and what's superfluous and what can be eliminated, it's really a very fascinating exercise. Again, a lot of signage is obligated. It's, since it's wayfinding or it's regulatory, we say. It helps people get out in an emergency. It has to be immediately legible and you must have it. 
There are combinations of things that you can do uh, that, uh, so that you, so things that you need to say can be said in a creative way. And that's what we did, where we took exit signs, for example, and used the new font with some very creative kind of imagery, sort of a deco imagery, in order to convey that message in a more creative way and more appropriate to the building. All these little icons, for example, that's a handicapped person, but it uses this uh, sort of deco imagery that we picked up in other locations from the building. Some of the signs are original. Um, some of them are, uh, are intended to be representative of original. These were landmarked and left behind, and these were kind of uh, exceptions to the rule, but they're illuminated and original, so we left them. But this is an example of a new sign that's also illuminated with an LED fixture behind, but uses the new Empire State Building, or ESB font, as we call it. And this is the final product. I do have to say that as much as it was a collaborative effort, I'm sure in 1931, to be able to build this building in 14 months, so was a process like this. And I'm pleased that members of that team are here this evening, but it really was an extraordinary effort. As architects, we kind of think of ourselves as shepherds sometimes. Uh, understanding the intent and mapping the way, if you will, but having a very enlightened client was essential and necessary to the completion of this product, project, someone who really understood what he wanted and what we needed to do to get there, but then also having an extraordinary collection of engineers and consultants and then also suppliers to be able to work with us in a creative and productive way to recreate this and, and restore this extraordinary place. Uh, that's it.